Okay, welcome everyone. It's good to have everybody here in the room at 24th and Lake at the Omaha Revive Center and everybody watching live online all over the state. It's great to see everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Sumrick. I'm Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska. And this is a special program today in partnership with the Empowerment Network and the Revive Center um, to uh, explore the stories of 24th and Glory in conversation with Johnny Rogers and Dirk Shadlin. And uh, we're just so excited to do this. It's our first time doing a curiosity connection program, as we call them, hybrid with the in-person audience and, and live online. We're very grateful to Willie Barney and Yolanda Barney for uh, helping make this program at the Revive Center happen online. Uh, Humanities Nebraska is a statewide nonprofit organization whose mission is to explore what connects us and makes us human. And we do that in a lot of different ways, and with, but it's all in partnership with other people and other organizations all across the state. Uh, we couldn't do it without, without you all. Um, I also want to recognize our board member, Edgar Hicks, here uh, as, uh, from Humanities Nebraska's board. And also Maggie Smith, the executive director of the Nebraska Cultural Endowment, one of our important source fund, uh, funding sources, as well as the Humanities Nebraska staff, Christy Hyatt, Carly, Heather Thomas, and LOD, our intern, is also helping us out today. So thanks to all of them. We have, like I said, we have a lot of people watching from online from all over the state. And for those people who are online, uh, feel free to put in the chat uh, uh, where you're from and who you are and say hello that way. And when it, please know that when it gets to questions, we will be looking for online questions as well as questions here in the room. So we will kind of handle all of that together. The people online, you can just type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box and, and we'll get to them. Now I would like to turn it over to Willie Barney from the Empowerment Network to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to all of those that are online with us and welcome to those that are in-house here at the historic corner of 24th and Lake. Uh, we are so excited that you uh, came out and joined us for this Black History event. We're incredibly excited to have Humanities Nebraska being a part of this and allowing us to uh, join in on this. I uh, wanna say uh, thank you on behalf of the Empowerment Network and thank you on, behi um, on behalf of the Revive Center Omaha. We're incredibly excited to have this program and we look forward to hearing from Dirk and from none other than Johnny Rogers. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you, uh, Dirk. Uh, we, have, we had the opportunity to actually work together at the Omaha World Herald some years ago. He is an award-winning author, uh, has doing, doing amazing things. Just want to let you know a few things. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about his legendary book, I think it's legendary, uh, that he captured this incredible history and has told it not only about sports, but about the civil rights movement. And for those that don't know, Omaha um, as a city was on the forefront of civil rights uh, on a national level. So his book is called 24th and Glory, the intersection of civil rights and the Omaha's greatest generation of athletes. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about from him, but can we please welcome Dirk Chatlin. And we also have with us none other than Johnny uh, Rogers. Uh, Johnny is not only uh, just a historic figure, not only in the city, but across this country uh, with his legendary status on the football field, but even beyond that, his accomplishments, uh, uh, really a player of the uh, decade, right? Century. Of the century. Yeah. <laughs> Let me make sure I got that right for y'all. Uh, player of the century. And uh, he not only has a great career in sports, but a business leader all over this country, speaking to youth. Um, he's committed, he's been uh, president of the 100 Black Men, very engaged with the Empowerment Network and many other initiatives in this city. So we are honored to call him a friend and he truly is legendary as well. Can we please welcome Johnny the Jet Rogers. Uh, with that, we're gonna get right into the conversation. Again, we welcome you here to the corner of 24th and Lake. We welcome each and every person that's online with us. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we're honored to be a part of this. We look forward to your questions as we get later into the program. But with that, Dirk and Johnny, it is yours. Uh, Johnny, it was nice of you to bring your Heisman Trophy today. <laughs> well, we had Eric bring it. Thank, thank you, Eric. <laughs> I was going to bring mine also, but it's being cleaned right now. So you go, guy. I didn't know you had it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot newer than yours. <laughs> It's what they call a replica. Yeah, mine's 50 years old now. Uh, I, 
if we have any any issues with audio, just let us know and we'll try to correct it. Um, I've always thought that this neighborhood was magical in some way, um, almost indescribable. And five minutes before this event starts, the inspiration for this entire story, this entire project, the unofficial narrator of North Omaha history, uh, who lives in St. Louis, Missouri, 89 years old, and through that door he walked in. Uh, Rodney Weed's sitting in the back enjoying his lunch right now, uh, a good friend of Johnny and, and a mentor of Johnny's and a, and a dear friend of mine too, and uh, it just, it's a thrill to be here, but it's especially a thrill to be here with, with Rodney sitting here. So welcome Rodney Weed, please. All right, Rodney. Okay, I'm a writer, so I've, I've prepared a little bit of a script. Uh, so I apologize if I'm looking at a paper, but, but I wanted to prepare a little bit. Um, it's a thrill to be, to be here with Johnny. It's especially a thrill to be here where we are, uh, at the epicenter of, of North Omaha history. If you stood in this exact spot at some point in the middle of the 20th century, you might have seen Bob Boozer or Bob Gibson dribbling a basketball to the YMCA, or Joe Lewis or Jackie Robinson preparing for a football game at Creighton University, or Oscar Robertson or O.J. Simpson walking down the street to the Bryant Center, or Ray Charles or Chuck Berry preparing for an evening set at the Carnation Ballroom, or Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. preparing a speech, or Robert F. Kennedy preparing for his campaign for president. And while 24th and Glory is on its surface a sports story about a group of athletes, it's just as much a story about a community, a community of teachers and butchers and musicians and morticians and pastors and trash collectors and packing house workers who built something special here. It is a neighborhood where people took care of each other, where people fought for each other, where people inspired each other. They did not sit inside on Sunday afternoons staring at screens and picking fights on Twitter. They dressed up and went down to 24th and Lake to rub elbows and talk and celebrate community. They believed in community and still do. That's what makes North Omaha history timeless. That's what makes it universal. We'll get to all of that, but I want to start today uh, with Johnny. He's the star attraction, the unofficial mayor of North Omaha. <laughs> How have you never been elected to anything in your life? Has because it... I, I have sense enough not to run for anything in my life. <laughs> he has signed more autographs than Michael Jordan, I think. Uh, he is the 1972 Heisman Trophy winner. I do some high school coaching, some high school basketball coaching, and I was on the phone yesterday walking into the school, and I had the phone up to my ear, and I, I was finishing a conversation with Johnny, and I said, okay, Johnny, I'll see you tomorrow. And one of the high school kids was walking into the school at the same time, and he said, who is that? And I said, Johnny Rogers. And he goes, no, it wasn't. <laughs> And I said, yeah, it was, it really was. And I gotta be honest, that kid has never thought I was cooler than he did at that moment, talking to Johnny Rogers. Uh, but once upon a time, Johnny Rogers wasn't Johnny Rogers. Johnny Rogers couldn't get on the field. He was a grade school kid over at Coons Park. Uh, and Coons Park was, was the ultimate playground, the ultimate sandlot in North Omaha. This was the glory years of the neighborhood, the 50s and 60s, and on weekend afternoons, kids gathered over there for pickup games. If you wandered over there in about 1960, you might see Roger Sayers, Gail Sayers, Ron Boone, Marlon Briscoe, all role models for Johnny. And Briscoe would even walk six miles from South Omaha just to get to North Omaha to participate in these pickup games. So picture little Johnny Rogers sitting in the park, chomping at the bit, watching Gail Sayers break some ankles, as the kids would say, <laughs> and wondering when he was going to get to the point where he could play in the same game as Gail. Two of the greatest runners ever, occupying the same space at the same time. 
That is North Omaha in its essence right there. This wasn't organized youth sports with $100 uniforms and parents watching on the sideline. This was old school sandlot stuff. Grass stains and skin knees and imaginary out of bounds lines staying out till the street lights came on. In North Omaha, it was a time of extraordinary vibrance and progress and tension and pain and above all, a time of change. The civil rights movement was in full swing and it wasn't just in the South. Here in Omaha, one of the nation's first civil rights organizations started on this street after World War II. Before Dr. King was boycotting buses in Alabama, Mildred Brown, America's first female black newspaper publisher, was doing it here, using her Omaha star to raise awareness and to rally support. This place was as vibrant as anywhere in the Midwest. Here in one mile of 24th Street, you could count more than 150 businesses. A few miles down the road in South Omaha, the city had just become the number one meatpacking hub in the world. South Omaha slaughtered 10,000 animals a day. And if you lined up all the livestock in 1955, they would have wrapped halfway around the world. The work was brutally hard, but those paychecks attracted hard workers. Czechs, Poles, Russians, Mexicans, Native Americans, and blacks from the, Omaha, from the American South. That last group moved into an overcrowded neighborhood, one square mile in size, right where we are today, just north of downtown. It was Omaha's segregated neighborhood. And the children and grandchildren of those meatpacking migrants became the greatest generation of Nebraska athletes, world-class athletes. Before Johnny became the most electric player in college football, he watched guys like Gibson and Boozer climb the mountain ahead of him. They all knew each other. They all cheered for each other. They all pushed each other. Johnny was the last one of that group, and it took a while for him to prove that he belonged on fields like Coons Park. But the big kids learned what Oklahoma and Alabama eventually did. Tackling the jet was like trying to snap a photo of a shooting star. Even if you saw him, you didn't have time to grab him. So Johnny, with that, uh, I want to just ask you, what are your most vivid memories of this place growing up on the north side? Well, first I'd like to say uh, thank you everybody for, for coming out this afternoon. There's nothing more exciting than being part of our history. And when you talk about history, we talk about his story. And this is our story. Um, what came out in Omaha, Nebraska. Right here where we're standing, we just called headquarters because this has always been a significant place, 24th and Lake. It was always happening on 24th and Lake. You could go from 24th and Lake to, to Ames all the way down to uh, <clears throat> Cummings down here and there were nothing but businesses that were stacked up all along the way, entrepreneurship. Uh, everybody was living pr a pretty good life. With the packing houses going on in the construction, keyword construction, um, there were people that had jobs, they had money. Uh, the economy, economy was pretty much booming around and, and people, I don't think we were rich, but everybody was really had enough and it was enough to really go around. So it was some pretty special days and times and uh, growing up around here, I had no idea the type of history that we had that took place there with the athletes that, uh, that we came across, but uh, they were here and they did do what they did. And you can go all around the country and don't find athletes who took that extra step to really thought to try to be best that they could possibly be. We weren't trying to be good. We were trying to be world-class and they turned out to be every single one of them are world-class athletes. Johnny, when, when did you realize that, oh my gosh, these guys are famous around the world. Like, holy cow, Gail Sayers isn't just the kid at Omaha Central, he's the greatest running back in the NFL. Like, that had to be sort of like a, an aha moment at some point. It was, and it happened with Boozer, and it happened with Sayers, and it happened with Gibson. And like, 
you know, you turn around and snap your fingers and Roger Sayers is the fastest man in the world in 1962. Like, how does, That's right. that had to be striking to a young kid. Well, in 1962, it really was. I mean, you, you, you know, when you beat Bob Hayes, you were the fastest man in the world. And that just proves it. And uh, you, as my life went on, it was different times in life that I could watch Bob Gibson on TV. There was times in here, there's Gail Sayers coming around on TV. Marlon Briscoe showing up on, on TV. Bob Boozer was really ahead of my time, but I knew Bob right from, uh, from uh, Rodney Weed here. He was uh, always really around, and my, uh, one of my mentors, Charlie Washington, his was his responsibility along with Rodney to actually keep a connection going on between all these athletes and all these people. I think every single one of them knew Rodney and Charlie, and Charlie Washington, and they were their mentors as well as they were my mentors, and we just passed that mentorship on and, and down. When I, when I was researching this book back in, 2000, starting in about 2006, um, it was it was based on a, a a revelation for me that on the same day in 1968, uh, Bob Gibson won his seventh consecutive World Series game, which was a major league record. Um, Gail Sayers had the greatest run of his NFL career, and on that same afternoon, Marlon Briscoe became the first African-American to start a professional football game at quarterback. All three of those things happened on the same day when Johnny was, meanwhile, was a senior at Omaha Tech. And so that, that was the spark for me to start digging into the research. The guy who walked through the door 20 minutes ago uh, was, was one of my first phone calls because he is the historian of this neighborhood. Uh, and knows everybody from, you know, he's Bob Gibson's best friend to driving Martin Luther King Jr. around town to, you know, planning, planning protest activity with Stokely Carmichael to mentoring Johnny Rogers. I mean, Rodney Weed is, is the godfather, right? Uh, and, and like I said, it's a thrill that he's here today. But, but he, he opened my eyes to the magic of this place. And one of the things that he opened my eyes to was the role of that packing house culture, that industry in South Omaha, in creating uh, not only a financial backbone for the neighborhood, but a work ethic that filtered all the way down through the generations. And Johnny is a testament to that because Johnny, tell, tell him about your grandfather. Your grandfather was, was working down there uh, for, for a lot of the, the 40s and 50s, right? Well, my grandmother would, would pick me up from school every Thursday and drive me over to, to South Omaha with her so we could pick up my grandfather and his check. <laughs> this is every Thursday. <laughs> I'd also like to say that in 1969, when all this was going on, after the first year, I got drafted to the to Los Angeles Dodgers to play baseball behind all these guys that same, that same year, 1969. Yeah. And uh, my baseball uh, was because of Josh Gibson. You know, Josh Gibson was, was the main reason uh, why I got drafted to the, to the Los Angeles Dodgers because of his training. He was my coach pretty much from the YMCA uh, all pretty much all my years until I went to Tech High. Uh, when I went to Tech High, John Morris uh, kind of took over, but it was uh, Josh that actually got me, who taught me the game, who taught me to play shortstop, taught me how to bunt, taught, taught me how to, you know, to run the bases. Everything about baseball initially to get my interest up uh, to peak to the level where I thought I could take it to the next level was for Josh Gibson. You want to tell you want to tell him about uh, Josh Gibson making you walk home from South Omaha one night? Oh shit! Yeah. I can't remember exactly why, um, but if you missed, uh, if you struck out, you did something wrong. You had to walk. You had to walk from where we were, and so they made he made me walk from South Omaha all the way back home here uh, to North Omaha in this neighborhood where I've always lived. Pretty much in this neighborhood, I still live. In a few blocks down on Work Street here now. Uh, but I pretty much grew up on Pinckney Street and Evans Street, and that was connected right straight down to Coons Park, where a lot of these things were actually happening. But uh, we had some tough coaches. I remember Bob Rose from uh, my junior high. Uh, he taught me basketball, um, taught me how to shoot with my left hand. But I think the most significant thing that I, I can remember is the one time he told me that I was a sad sack 
and told me to run around the gym until he got tired. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out when he was going to get tired. <laughs> And I ran, I ran, I ran, and he was serious. And I just kept thinking to myself, well, how, I wonder how long it's going to take him to get tired. But, uh, but he was a disciplinarian, uh, but he taught us the basics. And we got, he was really a tough coach, but we learned. We learned, and we learned how to, to come from behind to win. Uh, we learned more than just basketball. He taught us, you know, baseball and stuff, too. In junior high school, at Horseman Junior High. And... I went to Lothrop first with George Bar Barber. I think the first time I ever really got into significant sports was I was coming through the gym one day and George Barber, our uh, coach for a sports coach there, the grade school, uh, they were tumbling. They were doing tumble, you know, they, where you do flips and forward rolls and back flips and front flips. And uh, I, I mentioned to him that I could do that. And they were doing back flips at the time and they had the belt on. And they were taking the guys and was flipping them through the belt and you could take the belt. And so I told him, well, I think I can do that. And he said, well, come on and you try it. So I walked over there uh, towards him and I stood there and I just did a flip without the belt. He said, you're on the team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but then he taught me a lot of different things. We used to take, we used to perform at the crossroads almost every week. The whole tumbling team, where we take everybody out to the crossroads, and the crossroads is like going out of town. Nobody went past Seventy Second Street. Seventy Second Street was a long way, you know. Yeah, so you go to the crossroads. That was kind of big time. So everybody would come through and we would put on a show uh, at the crossroads. And so, you know, you learn how to, to hold yourself in front of people. Uh, you learn a lot of different things when you can uh, deal with crowds and things. You don't get ner nearly as nervous at people, especially when you learn it early in life. And when you connect the things from tumbling, coming up, to the YMCA, to my times in high school, and then on college, it was always a connection and always a different mentor that was taking the steps passing the baton on to others uh, in the trails that I was following in. And these people here had been there before me. And so they were quite recognizable as I went on in life that where I'm trying to go, some of our people already been there. It doesn't seem so impossible when you know people that you really know that in your neighborhood or that, are, that are became famous and are doing things that people hadn't done before you don't think that you can't do it you think you can do it so you, you know you're more positive and then there's people as you go up that you can actually talk to you know it was nothing to really be able to talk me and Marlon Briscoe hang out in Omaha Nebraska and San Diego as well um, you know for for years and years I knew Gail Bob uh, through uh, through Josh Gibson uh, it just really makes a difference that when you're engaging with your community is why I try to stay pretty much engaged and try to visit a lot of the different junior high schools and high schools, just so at later on in life, the people, you can talk to them and you will know them because you at least have met them at some point in time in your life. And I really contribute a lot of my success to their success because they just showed us where we were trying to go and, and so you can get there. And, and then, like I said, it's not just to be good, they were great. These guys are some of the greatest guys of all time. Bob, clearly, I think most people will, 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 will vote that Bob is probably the best pitcher of all time. Does anybody here disagree that I got somebody better? Like a Sandy Koufax or somebody? <laughs> Gail Sears had more moves than Allied Band Lines. <laughs> more moves than Carter had Peels. And Marlon, but they called him the musician. And get, I mean, and Roger, Roger was the fastest man in the world. You make a great point that, and I probably um, didn't appreciate it until conversations with you, but, but just that sense that it didn't seem so impossible when people you knew were doing it, right? Um, no, it is possible, see? I know, it didn't seem so, so you impossible. Take, you have to take it up higher there, right. see? Yeah. Yeah. No, I... I <laughs> I'm from a town of 392 people that geographically is about the same size as North Omaha. If, if a World Series MVP would have come out of Rising City, Nebraska, <laughs> I might have thought I was, you know, living in an imaginary world or something like that. And you were walking around, and, and there's five of those guys, right? So 
Uh, well, it, they're it, spread it, out. You don't even know. You know, like I said, it's amazing to see Bob Gibson on TV pitching in a World Series, and his his brother was my coach. Yeah, it's amazing. Let, let's focus on Josh because if there's a hero to this story, and someone who who passed away long before he ever got his credit that he deserved, it's Bob Gibson's older brother Josh. And Rodney is, is the primary source of, of these stories, uh, but there's lots of other people that would, that would, uh, would testify to the same thing. Um, Josh Gibson was, was a remarkable person uh, and, and really sort of the patriarch of this whole, this whole history because he was uh, uh, 15 years older than, than Bob Gibson. He was a World War II vet. He came home, he got his degree from Omaha University and got a master's degree from Creighton University at a time when that wouldn't do you much good because an African-American with a master's degree from Creighton still couldn't get a job in Omaha Public Schools. Man. He wanted to be a teacher, he wanted to be a coach. Nobody would hire him to do it. So he goes to work at the, at the YMCA and the city rec department and essentially creates his own PE class here in the neighborhood with hundreds of kids, okay? If OPS isn't gonna hire him, he's just gonna do it in the streets. That's something. And Josh, he does it. It starts with baseball, it starts with Rodney and Bob and, and their, their age of kids. Um, and they, they've got a remarkable story of that first Little League team that they named after the, the Kansas City uh, Monarchs, the Negro League team in Kansas City, the Negro League team that they would see roll into town up North 24th Street on the buses and chase them down for autographs. They named their Little League team after that group. And in the late 40s, they, they would go barnstorming, essentially. They couldn't get games in Omaha against, you know, Benson or Millard or, you know, Dundee. So they would go out into the country. Josh would, would load these kids up on a bus on a truck, whatever he could find to take these kids out in the country, and they'd go play games out in, in western Iowa, uh, wherever they could find. One, one day they showed up for a, uh, for a game, I forget that Rodney would know it, the, the town, uh, and there's a, there's a big uh, a polio fundraiser. They were essentially part of, a, of, a, of an opening of a new ballpark in this little town that, that doubled as a polio epidemic. Uh, fundraiser because the, the country was being ravaged by polio at that time. And Rodney's got all these incredible stories of Josh who, was, who had all of Bob's tenacity um, and, and, you know, sort of in coaching form. So if he didn't like a call, he'd storm out of the dugout and go chest to chest with the umpire. A few times he'd pull his team off the field. Uh, as Rodney describes, you know, he'd get upset and he'd, he'd you know, walk his big ass out of the dugout, as Rodney would say, and, and <laughs> Rodney's doing the hand motions right now. He, he wouldn't walk. <laughs> he run. There was a, there was a, my, one of my favorite stories is there was a, there was an umpire in, in a small town in Iowa who was the, the town sheriff, and he wore a, a baby mattress as, uh, as his chest protector, uh, and he had this terrible stutter, and so when the ball would cross home plate, it would take him two, three, four seconds to get the word out of whether it was a ball or a strike, and Josh was so angry by him at the end of the game, you know, that, that, he, that he threatened to pull his team off the field. But Josh created this culture, starting with baseball, that ended with a, a state midget league championship in 1951 in Wayne, Nebraska, where they won it. And it transferred into basketball, into track and field, into, you know, everything from badminton to wheelchair basketball to woodworking. I mean, Josh is, I don't know how he ever slept, Rodney. Uh, but he created this culture of sports achievement and motivation and driving these kids who were, by the way, becoming pretty good students because they'd show up to baseball practice and Josh would have a stack of, of books under his arm from Creighton University where he's getting his master's. And it, it, it just, he's planting seeds everywhere. And right Rod, along with Don Benning. Don yep, Benning, and Don Benning Bob Rose. And there's yeah. this culture of mentors and coaches and Johnny was was directly a benef a beneficiary of that because Charlie the, Washington, Charlie Washington, these guys invested thousands of hours, thousands of hours in kids like you. And it, it 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 you know the cool part from my perspective is the same guy who coached Bob Gibson coached Johnny Rogers, <laughs> right? How cool is that? Yeah, that is. 
Charlie Washington was, had a big part in all that too, because there was a lot, a lot of times he had to have money to go do things or to be involved in things. And Charlie was the guy that would go out and, and raise money or go out to different corporations and companies to get money from different people to pay for different things. He was really one of the significant forces around it that kept us connected along with Rodney. He and Rodney used to be ace boon coons, you know? <laughs> it was running the deal together. But we came along at a time where guys were definitely were doing things for the, for the love of the game. They weren't doing it for money. They weren't really getting money, uh, anything really to be paid that much. They weren't trying to, they, they gave up entrepreneurship and money and different things in order just to help build the community and, and make sure the kids were really getting the type of nurturing that they really needed. And you don't appreciate that type of stuff until afterwards, until you've been actually been through that and been through that with uh, some of the guys here that you connect uh, with. But we were very fortunate. We had just come along at a time where, where God was looking down on us and, uh, and to show us that, that kids don't do what you say, they do what they see you doing. And I think the biggest thing that I learned from all this is that you are what you think about most of the time. You are what you think about. And so he gave us, gave us the ability to think about being great baseball players or think about being great football players or think about doing well in school. Whatever you think about, thoughts are not just things. Thoughts are the cause of things. And if you hold a thought long enough, you can have it. Now, if you hold a good thought long enough, you get it. But if you hold a bad thought, you can get that too. So it's not a chance, it's a choice. But all of us, we are what we think about most of the time. So what are we thinking? Because we had these guys in front of us, we were able to think. We were able to dream, you know, dream and dream big. It's, not, it's nothing better than dreaming big. If you're sitting there and you don't even have any money, but you see somebody on TV and in one of the greatest pictures of all time, he, you figure he must be rich. <laughs> so let's go do that thing. But I, I just want everybody to just think about when you talk to your kids and they want to be what they want to be or do different things, just to keep thinking about it. Just keep it on your mind, thinking about it, you know? Because it will come true. Just don't think bad thoughts, because you think you can't do it, then you're right. You think you can do it, then you're right. Whatever you believe, you're probably gonna be right. What do you believe? What are you thinking about? Yeah, no, it's it's a great, great point. Um, and Johnny, you know, one of your, one of your values to this community, even today, certainly back then and even today, is, is a motivational value. It's an inspirational value. In the same way that you were inspired by those guys, people were inspired by you. And one thing that I appreciate so much about Johnny is, is he takes that seriously. And, uh, you know, he's, he's still living right over here. And kids are, you know, kids are walking up to his door every day. And, you know, they want to see the Heisman Trophy winner. And that's, that's pretty cool. So... Um, they, they can't see the Heisman Trophy, though, because we keep it down at Black Heritage Museum. <laughs> they can go down there and they can see it anytime they want, anybody want that comes through there. Uh, we keep the Heisman down, down there just so people can see it, right across the street from the, um, from the um, Omaha Star. And the Omaha Star, that was the first job I had was selling Omaha Stars. Yeah, but Charlie Washington got me on at, uh, at, uh, at the Omaha Star, and that was the first time that I got paid for doing anything was when I was selling Omaha Stars. Johnny, obviously the, the neighborhood at that time was, was growing, it was changing, but it was also, you know, this is the, this is the middle of the civil rights era. I mean, it's, it's very segregated at that point. What role or what, what sort of awareness did you have of, of the discrimination that people here faced and the second, you know, its place in in the broader context of Omaha and Nebraska and the country, because it was not a it was not a level playing field at that time. Well, we had a, we had a great community. We had a lot of opportunities, a lot of things going. Like I said, with the packing houses, people really who were, were doing pretty good until we had the riots in sixty seven, sixty eight. And during that particular time, I think things started to change because at that. When we came through here and it, the riots came and people started losing their businesses, people couldn't make their mortgage payments, uh, businesses started closing, uh, then we started to know real poverty. When people really couldn't get help to get back up, uh, you could see that they were being discriminated against. They couldn't take it to the next level. And they weren't really able to, uh, to rebuild their businesses. I don't think nothing hardly rebuilt 
then after it got turned, uh, burned down, it never came back. It never, it hasn't came back yet to, to that particular point. So um, growing up when you're young, you really don't know that you're being discriminated against. It's not till you look back and to see all the different things that you did have or you didn't have and all the things that could have happened that didn't happen that you start seeing different things that were happening. And uh, like I said, in 69, I was uh, just graduating from high school and I was trying to get myself down to the University of Nebraska. Actually, I was trying to get to USC. I was gonna say, I was gonna <laughs> correct him on that. Yeah, he I, was dreaming about to, California. He yeah, wasn't dreaming about Lincoln. You no, know, SC won championships. You know, we but we had. Uh, I looked at Nebraska, and they was trying to get me to go to Nebraska. And 67, 68, they hadn't worked, run a championship since Jesus was the kid. <laughs> you know, said, Why would I want to go there? You know, but uh, Bob Devaney came and told me one day that uh, he was going to recruit more black athletes than any other time in history, and he was going to let them play. And if I came to the University of Nebraska, I could make that difference. And he was going to put them there, and we, we, we could win. And I believed him. I believed him, and he did. And we did have more black players. And I really didn't even realize that people didn't have black players until we played Alabama in the Orange Bowl. They didn't have, in the South. They didn't have but one black player on the whole darn team. I tell you, and he didn't even start. And after the game, when we beat him, Bear Bryant said, I'm going to go out and get me some of them. <laughs> and he did. Now you look at Alabama, and they're primarily a black football team all right, now. But they didn't have any black players going on at that particular time. Um, we, but we, we had no idea. We had no idea that they didn't until, until that time. I, I want to make sure that our audience knows that you're welcome to, to ask questions, to throw up a hand, uh, to type a question. Uh, we do want to get to those, and I don't want to miss any, uh, any, any good ones. Uh, but I, I do think it would be funny to point out that history could have been very different from a perspective of Nebraska football. Because in 1967 and 1968, Bob Devaney went 6-4 and four at Lincoln. And he was, he was on the hot seat. And when he was coming to see Johnny in the fall of 1968, they had just lost 47 to nothing to Oklahoma and Devaney was hearing from a lot of critics and there's a reason why people at Tech High thought Bob Devaney was on staff there because he was there so often to recruit Johnny Rogers <laughs> and that specific winner coincidentally Devaney turned over his offense to Tom Osborne who modernized it and then a year later Johnny Rogers enters the scene and Nebraska wins national championships in 1970, 1971. Johnny wins the Heisman in 72. This is the most important player in Nebraska football history right here. And it could have been very, very, very different uh, had Tom Osborne and Johnny Rogers not showed up when they did. Well, we had quite a few players like Richie Glover, Willie Harper, Spider Atkins, Marvin Crenshaw. There was quite a few black players that came along because he did what he said he was going to do. And that's one thing that we really wanted, to, why we liked Bob and we cared for him because he was, had integrity. Integrity is maintaining your commitment even after circumstances have changed. At some point in time, he could have not, he could have stopped recruiting black players, but they kept recruiting black players until we got enough to really to even that playing field. And it, it really made the difference in, in our history. And uh, after we won two national championships and, and beat North, well, we lost in my senior year. We lost a game or two, I think. But we wanted to go out. We wanted Bob to go out um, with a blast here. So we, we went to the Orange Bowl and we played Notre Dame. And just uh, for a going away present, we beat Notre Dame 46 6. <laughs> yeah, and then Bob went on to be athletic director then, and Tom became the head coach uh, the very next year. What was the, how did the neighborhood respond to, to Bob Devaney in Nebraska suddenly? Um, recruiting black athletes because Nebraska famously lost Gail Sayers in 1961. They, they were hot about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and a big part of the transformation of the program was was Devaney's commitment to North Omaha uh, that that started before you, but it sort of culminated with you. Um, well, well, Bob, not only North Omaha, Bob had a thing for Easton. He went to you know, Pennsylvania, like, Ohio. Uh, yeah, well, Jersey, you know, uh, Richie Glover and, and, and uh, Crenshaw, I think they were from New Jersey. 
So we, were, we recruited black players from all over the country, uh, guys that we had no idea, it wasn't my friends that were coming, there were guys that we made friends after we came and we got mutual respect uh, for each other because of our abilities. And um, we, we didn't have, on our team, I don't think we had any racial discrimination because of the way Bob put it, we were there to win. And we had to be there for everybody. So if anybody showed any type of racism or whatever, uh, we were on the team, they would get kicked off the team. So we became a real team. And I tell you, winning isn't everything. But that time uh, at Nebraska, we rated it right up there with oxygen. <laughs> it was pretty darn important. <laughs> Johnny, uh, Johnny thinks pretty highly of Bob Devaney today. Uh, he didn't think that he was so great at the start. Who did you think Bob Devaney looked like when you first saw him? It's a potato head. <laughs> I had no idea who he was. I told my mom he looks like Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> I think that's a good transition to any questions. Uh, feel free to raise a hand for Chris if you've got any online. Uh, we'll try to work in a few uh, other contextual stories as they go along, but go ahead. We do have a question here and then we'll come over to uh, Chris online. Uh, Nebraska, I think went 32 games in a row without losing from your junior, uh, sophomore year, junior year, and then the senior year. And then we went out to California and played UCLA. Do you remember who UCLA's quarterback was? I will remember if you remind me. <laughs> <laughs> a guy named um, Mark Harmon. Yeah, I remember Mark. And they, I know Mark. Yeah. And they somehow uh, beat us. Uh, do you remember that game? Oh, oh, yeah, I definitely remember the game. It was that we had some mistakes. Our big thing was not to make mistakes, but sometimes you, you get in the pressure and you do make a mistake and it will, and it will cost you the game. Uh, and that's kind of what happened because we, we still protest that we had the best team, uh, but you still have to be the best team on the field at that time. And so they were able to, to catch us sleeping or, and to catch our, our coaches not, not making some of the right calls too because we can only do what the coaches you know, send in for us really to do. So we, we don't always agree with all the calls. <laughs> Chris? Yeah. Looks like we may have a question online coming over that way. Thank and you, Herrera Willie. kicked that at uh, the winning field goal, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. It's all coming back to him now. <laughs> yeah, it hurts too. <laughs> We have a couple of questions related to mentoring. Um, one is uh, specifically asking to tell more about Charlie Washington, how he mentored, where he mentored, uh, and was he an athlete or a help coach? And then somebody, uh, another uh, viewer asked, how can we return to the type of mentorship you experienced to help youth today? Well, Charlie, Charlie was the kind of guy who would just would just take you under his wing and to do whatever your needs were at the time, you know. Um, and he, he led pretty much with Rodney. They were always out trying to see how we could just build on the, the community. Uh, today, we still do some of that thing, there's those same things, but we emphasize education more than anything. Education is not part of your life. Education is, is life itself. And everybody, you know, in our days, you know, people were trying to get to college and everybody was trying to get a four year degree. And your parents would always tell you, you gotta go to college and get a four year degree. Well, as strange as it seems, two year degrees work very, very well. And, and the people in the trades work very well. So when um, I came, I was sitting around one day, uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago, and I realized out of the blue or just from God, that the only category in college football they didn't have an award for was the punt returners and the kickoff guys, the return guys. And these were some of the baddest men on the planet. They ran 100 yard touchdowns <laughs> and they didn't have an award for them. And so it came to me that at that, that point in time that we came up with, I got some friends together and we came up with the Jet Award. And the Jet Award was, was, so, was put there just to honor the baddest male on the planet. If you can run a 100-yard touchdown, you need to get an award. And so we decided to take that particular deal, deal to raise money in order for to give people scholarships uh, in, in the trades. Because I came from Tech High, and Tech High 
uh, pretty much stressed, you know, emphasized on, on the trades. And all my friends that came out through the trades, they all had good jobs and done well. And actually, a lot became entrepreneurs. Nobody was doing because you kept getting better and better and better as you went along in your particular trade. So we were able, we started uh, giving scholarships in the trades and uh, we started uh, had Mike Yanni from Burlington Capital start putting the other people and start helping and we got together and right now we just got uh, a two million dollar grant uh, to actually to give scholarships to go to Metro in the trades. And whatever money that we give Metro for a scholarship, they match that money. So our $2 million turns into $4 million. And so we're able to help energize our community right now for people to get into the trades. And so we have more of an opportunity now and more funds to do more. And where that 2 and that 4 came from, there's more. So now we've learned how to take it to a whole new level uh, to get more people in our community uh, opportunities. And we're on top of it. Johnny's, yeah. One of the things that I appreciate about Johnny is, is his energy, you know, for community. Uh, and I think when I look back and do interviews on, on that era, um, to me, one of the biggest differences is just today, I think we are, we are much more isolated um, socially, physically. Uh, we have fewer friendships. We have, uh, you know, church life is not as vibrant. Community life is not as vibrant people tend to get home from work and they go in their house and they spend the rest of their evenings in their house or they spend most of their day in front of a computer screen or a television screen. And it didn't used to be that way, I don't think. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize the value of that stuff and how, how guilty I am of isolating myself instead of pouring back into community. Um, and, and some of that is just, you know, introverted nature, but some of that is, you know, we have a responsibility to, to pour back into our community, not necessarily for our own benefit, but for someone else's benefit. And again, I stand in front of the, the mirror telling myself that because I'm guilty of that. Um, but it's the history of this neighborhood is, is a lesson in that because, you know, they didn't have air conditioning conditioning on Pinckney Street in 1962. I mean, they got home from work at TV. <laughs> no, didn't, have TV. Didn't have Netflix, didn't have Twitter, didn't, you know, you, you sat on the porch, you talked to your neighbors, you watched the kids. You know, the joke I always say is when you got in trouble on Pinckney Street, you didn't get a swat from your mom, you got a swat from everybody's mom, right? Um, and, I, and I think we've lost that. I think a lot of the fraying of, of our, um, you know, communities and society in general is is we're too isolated i don't think we we i think we're too individualistic uh and i think one of the great lessons of this neighborhood is that it was we before me it was we before me whether it was josh gibson or bob rose or johnny rogers or thousands rodney of weed. other people rodney weed i mean it was we before me and i think part of that was we're living in a segregated world and I owe it to everybody else to lift them up and help them. Um, and I just think, you know, I think we've gotten away from that. And, and I think Johnny's a great testament to that. And I think uh, in a broader sense, the, the story of 24th and Glory is, is a testament to community, so. Okay, we have another question online. This might put Johnny in a difficult diplomatic position because the way the question is <laughs> the way the question is phrased is who's a better coach, Bob Devaney or Tom Osborne. But I think maybe it would be reflecting on the differences between uh, working with both Bob Devaney. Oh, and that's Tom an Osborne. easy answer for me. Okay, Bob Devaney taught Tom Osborne. You know, he was Tom Osborne's mentor, and and Bob um, uh, Tom just took it to another level. Uh, Bob was able to, to take it and win two national championships. Bob uh, 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 to take two national championships. Tom was able to take it to three and then take it on to the mentoring uh, uh, level to, to extend it on beyond football. But he was an extension of what Bob Devaney had did. Uh, Bob's key to success was that when we started winning games, winning bowl games, and they started getting bonuses and awards, he shared all that with his coaches. And no coaches, the same coaches he started with or the same coaches he finished with. 
He didn't have coaches that were coming and going because they weren't getting enough. He shared everything he had, which showed, you know, that was a lesson to learn too, for, for you know, to take care of the guys that are taking care of you. And so he never took the, the extra money. When he moved up, he moved Tom up. I mean, Tom took the, and there, there were a lot of coaches that were upset that Tom was the next one that came along. Coach Selmer didn't like that at all. He thought, and he, so Selmer was qualified. He was a line coach, but he was definitely qualified because all of our uh, uh, position coaches had the skills to be head coaches, but they never aspired to be head coaches because they were getting more benefits from following Coach Devaney uh, than they could really on their own. So Bob, Bob was a mentor of, you know, like Charlie and Rodney, uh, you know, he was leading the way on it. Uh, Tom was just one of the students coming up at that particular time, but he got, he got, he was such a hard worker that he really got, and, and a creator. He, Tom was a creator of the spread and the pro offense, which just came when he came. He created the spread offense and the pro offense, which you wouldn't really know what that was, but I had no idea that we didn't have an idea. He was the first one to do it. And we were doing things out there that people hadn't seen before. That's why we were fairly successful uh, because we were, Tom was really ahead of his time. I remember lots of times I'd be coming home two, three, four o'clock in the morning uh, from my party and Tom- From church, Light, from church. Yeah, Tom, <laughs> Tom Light would be on in the office. He's still up there in the office. Uh, doing something, whatever he's doing up there, but he's working while we out there getting our party on. He was drawing up plays for Johnny Rogers is what he was doing. <laughs> he drove a lot of them too. <laughs> Any other questions, Chris? All right, looks like we have a question here. Okay, he's got the mic coming for you. <laughs> I need to move like Johnny, huh? Bob Devaney, so he reminded me of uh, Gene Washington, who's a good friend, friend of our family, played for the Minnesota Vikings. He always wants to point out when we're together that Bob Devaney came from Michigan State. Boy, yep. And that, you know, the whole integration thing started at Michigan State. That's true. You know, so I thought about that. And then the other thing I thought about is, Maybe Gene, you know, he tells so many stories, but maybe this is a true statement because you said when you played Alabama, that, that uh, who was the coach? Uh, Bear Bryant said that after the game, he said he was going to get him. He was going to start recruiting. Well, his, his quote was, I'm going to go out and get me some of them. Yeah, I, I ran a 72 yard punt return on him, and he said he's going to go out and get him some of them. Yeah, he asked a quote. He actually said that because he didn't have any black players on a team and they said they weren't going to kick it and they kicked it anyway. And, and you know, we just, I tell you, it was really a, I hate to say it out loud, but it was a blessing they didn't have black players on the team. <laughs> <laughs> we might've got our ass kicked. <laughs> Shoot. But no, they didn't have any, any and our guys were a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. Uh, than their guys, and we just handled them without a, really a problem. I said, I think we beat them 36 6, I think. Uh, 38 to 6, yeah. Okay, I know it was a lot to a little. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, you know, it was a very important game in, in, in the Orange, but we were both rated number one. It's ranked number one at that time, weren't we? One and two? Two. Oh, yeah, okay, that's exactly right. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, we have a, a viewer out in Alliance, Nebraska, on the other end of the state, who asked Johnny to reflect on what glory means to you, thinking about the title of the book, 24th and Glory, and just what does glory mean to you is the question. Well, right off the top of my head, I think glory has to do with we're, we're, we're moving up. Uh, we, we have something to celebrate, you know, times are changing. And like I said, they are if you think they are, if you think they aren't, they aren't. It's whatever you're thinking, but we are have a glory days because we are, have opportunity to think our way on to the next level. It's just in, in community coming together because anything you can do by yourself just ain't big enough. I learned from sports that teamwork makes your dreams work. 
You don't win national championships by yourself. You don't win Heisman trophies by yourself. You don't build a community by yourself. It's always in conjunction with others that you make your greatest accomplishments and teamwork makes your dreams work. And that's why anything that I try to do, I try to get people in there with you because you got to have people access to different people who have access to other people and the different people and things. You can't do things by yourself. And a lot of people just want to be by themselves and do things by themselves. And you're not going to go very far with that way. The more people you can get access to and to get involved with whatever project you're working with, uh, the better chance you have to get it going quicker and better and faster. And it takes it takes a team. It takes the whole village. I do want to share while we're waiting on one more question. One of my favorite stories of, of Johnny senior year of high school. Back then you could play you could play as many sports as you wanted to, essentially. And so he's an all-state football player, he's an all-state basketball player. He gets to spring and he's out for track and baseball at the same time. Okay. So track, he's doing triple jump and stuff like that. I think the state's leading triple jumper. National champ. National champ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Johnny. Baseball. He's he's playing baseball at the same time. You're drafted to the Dodgers. But the funny part is, he doesn't have a car to get from baseball to track practice every day. So a young teacher at Tech High is is taking him back and forth. The same teacher who allowed Johnny to take his car out on prom, <laughs> spring of, and and that that teacher became a legend in his own right, and it was. You're not talking about John, are you? No, I'm talking about Gene Haynes. Oh, Gene, Gene, yeah, Gene. Gene Haynes was in charge of driving Johnny from track practice to baseball practice every day. Well, they used to take me to. Um, I used to go to the um, to the track meets in my baseball uniform, and I would take my jumps in a, in a triple jump and a long jump. And then they would drive me to the baseball game. I'd play the baseball game, and I'd read in the paper the next day who I beat. <laughs> we have one more question, and then we're, Go ahead, we're ready to close out. Um, I'd like to ask the, the, the author, um, Dirk, how did you select the title, and what were you thinking through the process of this? And then I want to kind of give uh, Johnny a little bit of hard time. I think it's hilarious that you had to correct him from decade to century. But as we age together, I understand. <laughs> you talking to Dirk or me? I, uh, <laughs> so, so the fascinating part of this, uh, I don't want to go, you know, don't want to fall down too deep of a rabbit hole here, but uh, had we just written a story about a history of North Omaha, I'm not sure it would have grabbed people, okay? Um, when I give my dog his medicine, his heartworm medicine, I've got to stick it in peanut butter, right? That's the way the dog eats it. Well, sports was the peanut butter for this story. So we tricked people. We told them a story, we told them a history of North Omaha packaged in sports. Um, and, and so to me, there was always two currents in this story. There was, there was a, uh, a social current, a civil rights current, a uh, history current. And then parallel to that was, was the sports. And once you get into the 60s, these two things start crossing paths in fascinating ways. Um, I mean, one thing after another. Gail Sayers gets arrested at the University of Kansas for protesting an open housing law. Uh, Arthur Ashe shows up at Peeney Park in the, in the summer of 1961, and they won't let him in Peeney Park uh, because, because he's an African-American and Peeney Park was segregated at that time. Uh, George Wallace starts his presidential campaign in 1968 at Civic Auditorium, and three nights of riots erupt in the neighborhood as a protest to that event, and caught up in that as the symbol of that was Dwayne Dillard, who was the best high school basketball player in the state. There's all these fascinating things. So to me, the story was really the intersection of sports and real life. And so when I started thinking about this neighborhood and how special it was, the word intersection kept coming back. And it was, you know, 24th and Glory became the intersection of, of guys like Johnny and what was happening in the world. Uh, my wife likes to give me a hard time because I, I was kicking around ideas and 24th and Greatness or something like that I had. And she said, that's terrible. 24th and Glory is way better. And so, you know, she deserves credit for the title, but that's kind of how it came about. And, and again, um, we, we try to trick people a little bit because 
they open it thinking it's a story about athletes, but it's actually a story about, about the neighborhood. One thing I'd like to point out that we haven't really mentioned yet too is it's what's incredible to me, uh, almost unbelievable, that Marlon Briscoe was the first black quarterback to play in the NFL. I mean, that was, and Bob Boozer was the first black Olympian right here from Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, we have a lot of firsts, along with Bob Gibson and the rest of them, but to be the first black quarterback in the NFL, that's, that's, that's and, deep. And he was, draft, <laughs> he was drafted as a defensive back. He was so good in college, but they didn't think he could translate to, to quarterback in the NFL, so they drafted him as a cornerback. I told him because he was shorter than I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't draft short quarterbacks. but <laughs> Before I close us out, um, I would like to have the privilege of asking Mr. Weed to uh, make a few Fantastic. final comments for All us, right. and, then I'll, and then I'll wrap it from there. Thank you folks. It's great to be back here. I was born and raised here, as some of you know, maybe John knows. I grew up in the housing projects uh, on 24th and Paul, across from Sam Flax, uh, the, the local pub. I'm just delighted to hear those two be so vociferate and so forth talking about the past of this great city. If I had John's money, or maybe Warren Buffett's money, I would issue a challenge to the world. If they could name a city that could boast of having born and raised seven persons that was born and raised and accomplished stardom, all America, etc., I would give them maybe $10,000 of Warren's money and $5,000 of John's money. <laughs> I don't think there's a city, and I've been around, I've traveled the countryside and part of Europe and Africa, of course, and I've n never seen or heard of a city this size or larger that could boast of seven Johnny Rogers, mm -hmm. born and raised, or they might have recruited born and raised in a city. And I want to say that I hope, I don't think I'll be around, but I hope my wife would let me know that Dirk is one of the greatest writers. I love reading and I've read many books, but this guy, Dirk, is one of the better writers in the country. And I just, that book, I'm sure most of you read the book. I read it three times. I pray that he'll produce something nationally and get a Pulitzer Prize or a big prize because he is, uh, to me, like Thor Neil Hurston, and that's that's a quiet. That's where I put him on. You know, on. And of course, you know, John is my all-time great, great person. I met him when he was ten years old, and we've been friends ever since. He, uh, Charlie Walsh and I, I got with and watched John as a sixth grader. I'll do everybody in the eighth grade. We knew that he would be what he is now. But what I want to say about John and that I'm just so proud of. Superstar athletes usually leave their hometown and go somewhere else to live and live nicely and, and, and you know, be harmonious among folks they just met. But here's a guy, John could have gone anywhere. He's known all over the country, but think of that he would stay in this beloved black community and become the role model and all the things. I know John well. I know he's always active in civic affairs, but I don't think Black Omaha appreciates him like I think they should. And I hope that they will, but very few athletes, very few superstar athletes are like my best buddy Gibson and Giant Rogers, stay where they're born and raised because all they do is just produce other giants. Well, I go on. But thank you for uh, having me, and I'm delighted, John, you called. Thank you, Rod. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Roger, Roger's not here, but I really wanted to point out, too, how significant it is to have Roger Sayers uh, still here in Omaha, Nebraska. And that Roger, I mean, you're the fastest man in the world. <laughs> I mean, golly. And your brother's the, the best running back in the history of all time, and that's in one family. Me twice? One, one was good enough. <laughs> Roger, yeah. Yeah, Roger, Roger beat Bob Hayes. You said twice? 
<clears throat> That's amazing. That's just amazing. I just don't know how blessed, more blessed we could get. And that Roger's still living. Ron Boone, he's not here as well. Ron is part of the group. Ron played, they call him the Iron Man. He played more games in NBA without injury than anybody else in history. He was an Iron Man for sure. That goes a long way and he's still alive too. But uh, Roger, myself and Ron are the only ones out of this group that are still here. And we're blessed to be here and we still give glory, glory to all these guys that we came up behind and, and to our community. And we just hope that, like I said, just think about it. I don't care what we're doing or what you decide to do. We have to start thinking of world class. It can't just be good, can't be the best in the state, can't be the best in the country. We got to be the best people we can be in the world. Johnny and Dirk, it's been such an honor and a pleasure to have this hour with you. Thank you so much. Please help me thank Johnny Rogers and Dirk Chatelain.